All right. So we're officially at start time. I'm going to give it a couple more minutes because I know that sometimes people have connectivity issues and blah, blah, blah. And uh, we'll get in. This could be a really practical class. You all are going to get your hands dirty writing a lot of code. It's great. But hopefully learning a lot and understanding what you're doing instead of just a bunch of copy paste. Okay, good. All right. This is super exciting. Let me go ahead and get things ready here, share my screen, and uh, we will get started. So we are going to have a Python class today. This is an introductory py uh, uh, coding class and a lot of fun to deliver this. I want to thank you all for attending. Super appreciate it. This is the first time we're doing this particular Python class, and we've changed a little bit of our technology setup. So there might be some little glitches and issues along the way. But at this point, I think we're all pretty comfortable using Zoom or Teams or any of these online meeting platforms. But just bear with us as we go through this. Guarantee you're going to learn stuff and hopefully really enjoy yourself. So about me, I'm Eric Gross. And yes, I do smile and laugh a lot. Um, and I'm a big old nerd. So I've been a developer for many, many, many years. Uh, also spent time in the Navy a long time ago as a nuclear reactor operator and electronics technician. And actually found out in the Navy that I really like to teach. I found out by accident because my boss told me, hey, tomorrow you're going to teach a class live. And I went, no, I'm scared. And then it turned out really awesome. Uh, I'm also the co-founder of the Tech Academy, which is one of the um, best coding boot camps in the world. More about that later. But yeah, that's me. So a couple of uh, housekeeping things before we get started. We do have an assistant. Uh, Regina is here uh, from the school, and you will see her in the chat. Um, more on, on how to interact with her um, in a bit. Uh, she's there to monitor the chat, answer questions, let people in. Um, please be courteous to each other. We usually have phenomenal people in these kind of classes because really bright, awesome people are interested in technology, in my experience. I will say that um, even though we're going to break this down as simply as we can, uh, there may be challenging things to go through, right? We're going to break this down really, really well for you. Part of learning technology involving, involves changing the way you think and grasping sometimes complex concepts. We'll break them down, but it might be challenged, which can be a fun thing. One of the key things I want to stress is that we're going to be writing code here in just a, in a couple of minutes. And for reasons that I'll explain, it should become pretty clear. When you're writing code, write that code exactly. And here's exactly the thing, right? Um, I want you to work in a distraction-free setting. I would personally like a distraction-free setting as well because I'm going to try to deliver a class to a whole bunch of people. So um, if you've got a bunch of noise around you, uh, try to eliminate that and just pay attention to what we're doing. I guarantee you, if you'll be here and participate and pay attention, you will absolutely learn valuable, cool information and come away with it very happy that you participated. But part of that is controlling your, um, your, your setting and making sure you're distraction-free. Now, what's the agenda? A uh, short intro about who and what we are. Then we dive right into writing a bunch of code. We'll spend a good chunk of time on that. Um, in terms of timing, we've designed this to last, quote unquote, about an hour with this many students in here, which is awesome, by the way. Um, we may go a little bit over in terms of timing. You should expect to look for about you know uh, 80 to 90 minutes for this. There'll be a brief Q&A at the end. Be glad to answer questions. Give you a little bit of data about our coding boot camps. And um, if you stick around to the end, we've got a free gift for you, which I think you'll actually really, really like. It's pretty cool. So that's our agenda. Um, one other quick thing. If we're writing code and you fall behind, don't worry. We do have to keep this at a certain pace so we can get through in a reasonable amount of time. But if we're writing code and you fall behind, don't worry about it. Just stop with the writing code if you've, if you've um, fallen behind and just pay more attention to what I'm teaching as we continue through uh, the, the class. At the end of the class, we're gonna give everybody a full copy of the code we're gonna write, a perfect working copy of it. And you'll be able to go through that at your leisure and, and pick up on anything you may have missed. Um, there's also gonna be recording, uh, recording this that goes up on YouTube in a couple of days. So you'll be able to follow along and get the full value out of it as well. So again, don't worry if you fall behind. I'll try to give people a reasonable amount of time, but if you do fall behind, it's gonna be totally fine. All right, so the school. 
and who and what we are, who's delivering this class. We're Coding Bootcamp, uh, founded almost 10 years ago. In a couple of days, it'll be 10 years, which is fantastic. Um, we provide certification programs, boot camps. We train people to be you know, well-rounded, entry-level software uh, developers and technology professionals. Our programs are cost-effective and they're self-paced, which is huge. You move at your own pace through the programs, which is really cool. Um, we try to teach people stuff that the, the industry needs right now. And by the way, the, the tech industry needs people badly. There is absolutely a talent shortage. And one thing I want you to clarify is why we're here, what our mission statement is. Our mission statement is to graduate entry-level technology professionals that excel in the basics of their field and thereafter have successful careers in the tech industry and whose actions raise industry standards and surpass client expectations. That's what we aim to achieve. All right, enough about us. Let's move into the class. I want to clear up a couple of key terms as we dive into this, just so you're not going into this with any misunderstandings about the terms you're, you're about to work with. First of all, it's just a program. A lot of this is to be common sense to you. A program is just a series of written instructions that you can enter into a computer that make it perform specific tasks. I wanna clarify what the purpose of a computer is here. The purpose of a computer is to take in data, to work with that data in some manner, and to send that data on. Now, I can send it on to a person or can send it on to another computer. But that's the purpose of the computer, to take in data, process the data in some way, and send the data on. So what we're talking about here in terms of instructions is those three things. You can instruct a computer to take in data. You can instruct a computer to process it in some manner, which we're going to do. It's going to be fun. And you can, you, know, you can tell a computer, give it an instruction to send data on somewhere. We're going to do that too, because sending data to a screen so people can read data is in fact sending the data on. So that's a program. What's a programming language? This is how we make the instructions. It's like a human language. It's an organized system of words, phrases, and symbols, but they're very precisely formatted. They are meant to be consumed not by a human being, but by a computer. They allow you to communicate with the computer, tell it what to do, and we use computer language, uh, programming languages to create computer programs. Again, this probably should be relatively familiar to you. Now, what we're going to do today is called coding. That is actually entering instructions into computers. And by the way, this is the first key shift that many people make as they start to move into technology. Instead of being a consumer of programs, you are the creator of programs. And it's a lot of fun to do. So code is the actual instructions you're entering in that make up the program. Coding is writing those instructions. So we're going to do coding. And the last thing is Python. Look, we put this out as a, code, a class about Python. What is Python? Well, it's actually relatively new as programming languages go. It was created in the late 80s by a Dutch computer programmer, Guido van Rossum. He spent decades at Google, by the way. Genius of a guy. Uh, my co-founder was able to interview him Wow, almost nine, 10 years ago at this point, and just a brilliant, brilliant guy. Python has become extremely popular. Uh, the, the language itself resembles English words and speech. You can use it for all sorts of things, creating apps for mobile phones, creating applications, programs, websites, games, which is what we're going to do today. We're going to make a game. So that's Python. Now, when I say we're going to make a program, I'd like you all to pay really close attention because what I'm going to go over in this next like almost 60, 70 seconds is some of the most important data you will ever learn about computers. Any computer program has five elements. Without these, it's not very much of a computer program at all. The first is an entrance point. What's the first instruction the computer is supposed to operate? You have to tell it where to begin. The second is control and branching instructions. These are the instructions we use in whatever programming language to control if, then, else, or decision points in a program. We create programs to make decisions that we could make manually, but when with the computer's help in automating them and making the decisions faster, you do that with control and branching instructions. Third element of any computer program is variables. These are essentially little buckets that you can put data into that the data can change as the computer program works. Without variables, you're writing computer programs that aren't 
that are working with data that can't change and it makes them not very valuable. Fourth element of a computer program, subprograms. These are programs within a program, small sections of instructions that you're going to need over and over again as the main program runs. If you find yourself repeating a series of instructions more than once, often you'll take it and put it into a subprogram and then just use the subprogram whenever you need that series of instructions to occur. And finally, the fifth element of any computer program is an exit point. There needs to be a way of telling the operating system, the part of your computer that runs all, all the background stuff, the part of your computer that actually lets you install programs, you need to be able to tell the operating system, hey, this computer is done, it's over. Any resources that you had helping that program, you can release them. We're not using that program anymore. These five different elements of a computer program are vital. And when you start to learn a computer programming language, if you focus on how these five things work in that language, it opens up a lot of understanding. You can learn the language faster. All right, now we're gonna have you write code. We're gonna do coding. We're gonna do writing these instructions. This is where you're gonna do the work. So I'm gonna give a moment for my assistant to put that link into chat. Let me verify it's there. All right, so Regina, if you can grab that, there it is. Everybody go ahead and grab that link and open it. And I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna open that link. So let me stop sharing for a second and show you what you're about to see. Many of you are probably already there. All right. So very brief description of what you're looking at here. On the left is a bunch of Python code. These are instructions. We're, not, we're just gonna get rid of all these, don't worry about them, but leave them there for right now. The point is on the left is where you write your code. On the right over here is where the results of your code will be shown. This will become very clear as we start to write our computer program. But this is our code editor. It's a, where, a place to put your instructions. The instructions go here. And where to see the output of your programs. And that's over here on the right. Good. So stop sharing for a moment. What I'd like you to do is set it up so you're able to see me on the left and your code editor on the right. And here's what I found is the best way to do that. Let me go ahead and first share my screen and clarify that what I'd like to have is on the left is your Zoom so you can see me typing. And on the right is the code editor. So you can see the results of your own work. You can do your work. And I'm going to give a bit of a moment to get that done. Um, generally, even if you, whether you're on a Mac or a Windows machine, if you'll re click on the very top of a window and then hold the key down and drag it over to the corner, or to the side, it should occupy half the screen. And most of the time with these modern operating systems, it then prompts you for what do you want on the left-hand side? What do you want to be on the other half? So again, I'm going to give people a minute to do that. J3, you got a 404 error? Oh, I see it. You got in now. Excellent. Thanks. All right, good. Let me take a sip of water here. All right, so we're about to code. All right, there's more people in the waiting room. So, oh, nope, don't look at that. <laughs> I don't want to give you the whole code. All right, so I am going to switch over to my, uh, my code editor. And again, I want you to have me on the left and your code editor on the right. Now, here's what we're going to do, okay? Um, we're going to erase everything here. So take away all that code. We're going to start over from scratch. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, remember, type everything exactly as I type it, okay? I'm going to type import random, and I'm going to tell you what that is. 
All right. So there's a concept in coding of what's called a library. And a library is a bunch of pre-made code that you can use in your own computer program. Someone else took the trouble to write up some really useful instructions for computers and packaged them all up in one container and made it available to you. Almost every computer programming language supports this. In Python, these libraries are brought into your program by using the import statement. So what we're doing is we are bringing in a library of code that happens to be useful for generating random numbers. And we're gonna use that in our computer program. So that's what import random means. All right, so what I'd like you to do is run your program. You see the little button at the top here? Nothing's gonna happen because we haven't told it to do anything, but we'll be able to tell whether or not we've made a mistake in typing in this code. So run it off to the right. You'll see a little bit of like busy work saying that it's, you know, executing and then nothing should happen. That's what you expect. If you get something different, if you get some error message, pay very close attention to how I've written this and make yours be like mine. Now, next thing, let's see what happens when you do make an error. I'd like you all to capitalize random and run the program again. And like me, you should see an error like this. No module named random. In Python, we call these libraries of code, we call them modules. Well, there's no module named random because to a computer, it doesn't know that when you type with an R capitalized, you really meant an R lowercase. It wants the exact name of that module, that library. So switch it back to random with a lowercase r, run your program again, and you should have no errors. All right, now, here's the first thing we're gonna do. We're gonna build a game of Hangman. For those of you not familiar, Hangman is a word guessing game. And as you guess a word, one letter at a time, if you don't get one of the letters right, you start to build someone hanging from a hangman's noose. <laughs> I don't know where this came from. I know it's not politically correct, but it's a super popular game and has been for many, many, many decades. So we're gonna build Hangman. Well, we need a collection of words that you're gonna guess from. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're actually gonna make a, an instruction that will give us a word at random from a collection of words. We do this by making a sub-program. Remember the five elements of computer program that I talked about, we're gonna build a sub-program. In Python, these are called functions. And when you make a function, you use the, the instruction def, which means define. And then you give the name of the function, the subprogram. We're going to say choose underscore word. And we're going to put open and close parentheses after it. Right there, we're saying, let's build a function called choose word. Now we put a colon. And this part is super important. When you hit enter, notice that we are indented by two spaces. See this? This indent is critical. It's important. This tells the computer when it goes to run your program, everything that's after the colon right here and indented is the actual subprogram. These are the instructions that we're going to build inside this function called choose word, the subprogram called choose word. So what do we want? Well, first we need a collection of words. So type words equals words is your variable. We need it to have the following words inside it, the following content. So hit your square bracket. A matching end square bracket should automatically appear. If it doesn't, type it in so you have exactly what I have on the screen. And now let's put the five different words in here. We're going to put in double quotes, Python, and then a comma. And then we'll do hangman, end quote, and a comma. Again, type it exactly the way I'm typing it. Then we'll do coding.
and a comma. We'll do programming. I like that. Programming and a comma. Let me pull this over so people can see everything. And then we'll do computer. Yeah, I think computer is good. No comma after the last one. No comma after computer. And then hit enter. Now. I'm going to leave that on the screen for a moment so you all catch up. What we've created here, this variable called words, is a collection. Now, this is a collection of words. We call those words strings, a collection of alphanumeric characters. But it's just a collection of words, five of them, Python, Hangman, Coding, Programming, and Computer. Now, we need a way for our computer program, when we start a game of Python, to pick one of those words at random. So this part's really important. Pay attention. We're still building the function called choose word. So this next instruction, which will choose one of those items at random, you have to indent. You have to hit the tab key. Hit tab so that you're lined up, your cursor is lined up with the beginning of the W in the line above it. Super important. This is how Python happens to work. If you don't indent, indent the right way, the computer misunderstands what you're trying to do. All right, so if you're indented those two spaces, by the way, use the tab key to do it. Now, we're going to put in the following, and I'll explain what it means. Type return, and then random dot choice. And then some parentheses, and then type words inside there. I'm going to leave that on here, and then I will explain to you what that is all about, what we're doing. Because there's so much learning opportunity just with what's on the screen. So let me just give it a second here for people to get done. Okay, so let's talk about what's happening here. Now, just stop looking at this exact code, this exact function. Never mind all the details inside it. Let's just talk about the idea of a sub-program. Remember that I said there were five basic elements to any computer program. Entrance point, variables, control and branching instructions, sub-programs, and an exit point. The way a sub-program works is that you've got a main program that's running, one instruction after the other, and all of a sudden, you find yourself needing those instructions that are in the sub-program. So that main program that's been running calls upon your sub-program and says, hey, do what you do. Do your work. Now, very often, that main program that's calling on the sub-program needs something from the subprogram. It needs it to do work and then give it something in return. Now, to avoid using all those pronouns, I'll say that sentence again. Usually the main program needs the subprogram to return something to the main program so the main program can keep on doing its job. And in this case, we're going to write a main program that's going to call the choose word function and ask it to give it one of these words. Give, it, you know, give me one of these words at random. And so we do that by inside the choose word function using a return command. Return will give something back to the main program. And we're going to do that in a moment so you can see it happen. So we do that by calling on this library or this module that we imported called random. We said that a library or a module is a collection of pre-made code, right? One of the pieces of code inside this random module is a function called choice. And if you give this choice function a collection, it will select one of them randomly. Notice, this is, notice that this reads almost like English. 
It's got to be precisely formatted because the computer's going to read through it, but it does work like English. Hopefully with the explanation I just said, you can see that when we call this function choose word, it will create a collection of five words and then give us one of those words chosen at random. Now, let's make sure it works. I hit enter. Notice where my cursor is. It's still tabbed in one in indentation. We don't want that. So backspace once. So you're back to the main level all the way to the left. And now we want to use this function. In order to do this, we're actually going to have to go back, go look at the first part of those five elements of a computer program that I talked about. I said that a computer program has five things. The first one was an entrance point. Let's make our entrance point for this program. In Python, the entrance point is a function that you make called main. So let's do DEF to define a function. Type main with these open and closed parentheses and put a colon. We're about to create the function that will be the very first thing executed as soon as we run our program. We're about to create this function. So hit enter. And if you format it properly, your cursor should indent two spaces. If it didn't, make sure you did line seven correctly. But now we're ready to write What's going to happen? Well, what do we want to have happen? Well, we want to, just to test that our code is correct, just to test that we're doing everything all right, we want to call this function right here called choose word and have it give us a word at random. And then we'd like to print that out. So we can literally just type print and we're going to call choose word. Make sure you type it exactly the way I do. I'll leave it on there on the screen for a minute. Now, that's it for now. Hit enter or backspace so you're at the top level. And again, here's another really, really important learning lesson. First, we've written enough that I want to test that I haven't made any glaring errors in what I've written. I'm going to run my program. Now, I happen to know that the program should not actually do anything yet over on the right-hand side, and I'll explain why. But I want everyone to run their program. And if you get an error in here, see if you can figure out what you've typed that's different than mine. You shouldn't get any output at all. And I want to explain why, because that might be confusing. If we look at lines seven and eight, we've created a, a sub-program. We call them functions in, uh, in Python. We've created a function that is supposed to print a word at random. Why didn't it? Well, it's because we haven't actually called this sub this, this sub-program called main. We haven't actually asked that it be executed. We've defined potential behavior. We've defined something that will occur. And what will occur is this line right here. We've defined something that will occur when we ask it to be occur, uh, to ask it to occur, but we haven't asked it to. So the very next thing we do is we ask it to occur. And you do that in Python with this kind of a odd backward syntax, which will make sense when we get it done. Do an if underscore, and now watch, this is two underscores, and not one. And then type name, and then two more underscores. I'm going to go slow here. So it's if space, two underscores, and the word name, and then two more underscores, and a space. And now two equals signs. And then a qu quotes. 
and now double underscore and the word main double underscore. I'll leave that on the screen for a second. What we're doing here is we're saying, hey, if the function that we're about to run is called main, then actually run it. This is the next line. You hit enter. You should tab over. Watch to see that it happens. The code editor should do it automatically for you. I'm going to leave this on the screen for a moment. And then let's run it. Now, I'll pull this over in case your screens are, are, are not showing it. My program ran and printed off the word Python. That is, in fact, one of the five words. So it worked properly. I'll run it again. And now outputted the word hangman. Run it again. And it should do yet another word. It didn't happen to choose hangman. It's random. All right. If you aren't seeing what i am uh, got here, then look at the syntax. All right. So we have successfully tested that we have a function called choose word that can choose words at random. Well, now we need to build some game logic. Here's what we want to do first. I said there wasn't going to be a lot of copy and paste in here, and there isn't. There's one thing I need you to put in that actually needs to be a long copy and paste because it's the symbols that represent your gradually building body hanging from the hangman's noose. Isn't that dark? So pay very close attention to where we're going to do this. On my line six, should be your line six as well, right after this line that says return random choice words, I want you to put the cursor there and hit enter a couple of times. Give yourself some space. Now, go to line seven, right in between those two things. And I'm going to need you to grab a big chunk of text. I am going to copy it. I'm actually going to put it in chat for everyone because I've just happened to have it right here. Grab that URL. This is what you're going to see. And you're going to want to you know, control A to select all and then control C. Or if you're on a Mac, command A, command C. Or however you want to do it. If you want to just drag your cursor all the way down, then do that. But copy all of this all the way down to the word tries at the bottom. Copy it. And put it right on line seven and paste it. Now, again, I didn't want to do a lot of copy and paste, but there's no point in spending a bunch of time helping you work this out. Let's explain what this is we're looking at. I'm going to give 30 seconds for people to do the copy paste. All right, so let's look at the first line. We are making a function. We've done this before. Notice, though, this one's a little different. We have something inside the open and close parentheses, and here is another vital teaching moment. We've said before that the way a function works is the main program calls on the subprogram, or in this case, the main program calls on our function. We've already covered the idea that when the main program calls a function, that it might be asking for something in return. We did that here on line five. We said the choose word function is meant to give us a random item from this collection. Well, what's also true quite often is that the main program, when it requests that a subprogram or a function actually run, needs to give the subprogram some information first. And it does that in Python by putting the information that's going to give it inside these parentheses. 
the information given to us to to a, um, a, a function is called a parameter. In this case, we're going to give the function display hangman a parameter called tries. And all this is is a number showing how many times we've attempted to guess letters in our word. So that's what this function is all about. It's a function called display hangman. We're going to give it a number that we happen to be calling tries. Then we set up a collection called stages. This is a variable. It's just a collection. We had a collection up here. You've already seen these. This is a collection. However, this collection that we're building just looks a lot more complicated. We can see that there's a, a, a square bracket and there's items in it separated by commas. And if we keep going down, there's a closing bracket. It's just a collection of symbols that will look like first a hangman with nothing, then a hangman with a head, then a hangman with a body, then a hangman with arms, and so on and so forth. So we're going to use this clearly to symbolize your progress through the game. This is what our function called display hangman is for. All right, enough of that. Let's move on to actually build some logic into this game to let people play the game. So after this line 71 that begins return and ends with tries, right after that, you're going to give yourself a couple of lines to do some work. Here's where we're going to build the, 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 the function that is actually playing the game. That we've got everything set up. We want to play a game. Here's how you do it. So we're going to define a function called, of all things, play. Make sure you give yourself some open and closed parentheses. And this function is going to take a parameter called word. So I'm going to leave that on the screen for a second. Scroll down a little bit so people can see it. Our function called play will take a parameter called word. In other words, what word are we asking people to guess? All right. So if you go to the end of the, of the line and hit enter, it should tab you over once. And from this point forward, your tabs are very important. So pay very close attention to what I'm saying. First thing is this. We need a variable. Write this down. Word completion. All right, I'll explain what I'm doing, but I can give people a second to write that down because a little bit complex. Okay, so let me explain what this is. If you played Hangman, you know that when we're about to guess a word, what people will do is they'll draw these little lines all in a row representing how many letters are in the word. Like if you're guessing the word game, there would be four of these little lines for G-A-M-E. And they, that just tells you how many letters are in the word you're trying to guess. That's what this variable called word completion will be. It will be a collection of underscores with as many underscores as the length of the word. This len is a function, but we're not, we don't have to write this one. This is just built into Python. If you call upon this function, call len, which stands for length, and pass in a string, in, in our case, it's gonna be a word chosen from this list. If you pass that in, then it'll, give you how many characters are in it for the, you know, for the word Python, that's six letters, P-Y-T-H-O-N. So that's what this word completion is, is how many spaces, or sorry, how many little lines to represent the number of words. So we've got that. Now, let's do another one. We're going to need something to tell whether or not we've actually guessed a particular, uh, 
a particular letter. So we're going to do a variable called guest and make it equal to false. That's pretty straightforward. Leave that on there for a second. And by the way, one of the things you'll notice I'm doing is as I write a line of code, I'm explaining each part of it. Oh, I apologize. This little symbol right here, the asterisk, means multiply. It's multiplication. Think of it as your X, you know, five times four, you would write it as five X four, right? In computer programming, we use the asterisk symbol, which is what this is right here, to represent multiplication. So that's yet another example. What you, the way we structure our boot camps, by the way, is the exact same way. When we're teaching you coding, every single word or symbol will be explained as you're going along. So you're not left with any mystery or confusion or having to figure stuff out just by context. We want you to understand each thing as you go. And that's how we're trying to teach this class. So we have a variable that we're going to use to figure out whether or not someone has actually guessed a particular letter. Now, let's say they do guess a letter. We need to be able to keep track of which letters they guessed. So let's make another variable and we'll call it guest underscore letters. And it is going to be an empty collection. Nothing's inside those square brackets. So at the beginning of us playing, it's just an empty collection. As people guess letters, we're going to put them into that collection so we can keep track. This is what we would do if we were playing it, except we would write the letters off to the side on some kind of whiteboard or something like we did when we were kids. All right, so now you have a variable that will hold our guessed letters. We also need to keep track of how many times they've tried to guess a letter. Why? Because we need to be able to draw the hangman body depending on how many tries they've made. So we need a variable called tries. And we're saying we get six tries. Now, why six? Well, the observant among you may have noticed that there are in fact, one, two, three, four, five, six different stages here. There's actually seven because by the last one you die, it's over. So we need to keep, you have six tries to try to get it. And after six, you lose the game. All right. So next thing, we're about to start playing. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're actually gonna interact with our user by printing something to a screen. Remember I said the five basic elements of a computer program, uh, oh, sorry. Remember I said the purpose of a computer program is to take data in, process it in some way, and then send it out. This is the first point where we're going to take data in. Oh, sorry, to send data out. We're going to print on a screen. Now, print is a function, so we put it in, in uh, parentheses. And inside uh, double um, quotes, we put what we're going to actually print on the screen. We're going to say, let's play hangman. All right. We also need to let people know how many times they've played. So let's do print. And we have, oh, we need, to, we need to print on the screen how much of our hangman's noose, this is the gallows, how much of our gallows and the hangman and the body are drawn. So let's print that. How do we print it? Well, we have to call this function called display hangman. So to print it, we just call it a function. Display underscore hangman. And we're going to, remember I said you're going to pass some information over to the sub program, over to the function. What information are we going to pass over to the function? the number of tries. Well, right now it's set to six. We'll see what happens if we run the program. 
So this is how we get whatever one, whichever one of these images that we need to print on the screen. We call the display hangman function and we tell it how many tries have been attempted. It starts with six. So what does it do? Well, here's another really cool piece of programming. Here's some data for you to learn. Let's actually analyze what's going on here when we call display hangman and we pass in tries. So let's take the very real instance of the first time we run this command right here. The first time we run it, we're gonna call this display hangman function and we're gonna pass in whatever the current value is of a variable called tries. And the first time we do, that value is going to be the number six. So let's go up to the display hangman function and see what happens when tries is equal to six. Here is our display hangman function and we call it and we pass in the number six right here. Now we have this collection that doesn't do any work. Work is done right here. We take this collection and we access one item in the collection. And we do that by using square brackets and putting a number in there. See, each of these items in the collection, here's an item, here's an item, and so on. Each of these items, the computer numbers them. And it starts at zero. So this is item zero. This is item number one, and this is item number two, and so on, which means here's item number six. So what happens when we call our function display hangman and pass in the number six is the display hangman function gives back to the program this exact set of characters right here. And that's what we print on the screen. So I've done a lot of work right now. I'd actually like to test this out before we move any farther. I wanna see if we can just get it to display the hangman. So after that, we'll build in more logic on the game. So let's go down to our main function. Remember the main function is the first function that will be called when we run our program. Now, what we had done is we just decided to put print choose word in here. We wanted to call the choose word function just to make sure everything works. But instead, we actually want to play the game. Well, let's call play. Now we have to pass in a word. Here's another really important lesson as a programmer. We need a random word. How do we get a random word? Well, we built a function to get a random word. We call the choose word function. So when we, let's get a random word. Let's type in word and we will call the function choose word. We now have a random word. What do we do with it? We call our play function that we built right above it. You can see play starting on line 73. We're gonna call that and pass in the word that we just created. So let's try this. Let's run our program. And this is what should occur. Let me make it more narrow so you can see the whole thing. We get this output. Let's play hangman and it prints off our scaffold and the noose right there is the noose. Again, it's a super dark game. I'm sorry. So if you don't get that, then you should check two places right here. Check our play function and make sure you've got exactly what I have and 
check that you changed your main function to reflect what I have. But if it did work, then one, congratulations, two, I did that to demonstrate another really valuable aspect of computer programming. When we're building computer programs, knowing that they will eventually be a little complex or sometimes very complex, it's very important to build a little teeny bit of the program and then run it to make sure it works the way you expected. And then fix anything that went wrong, add a little bit more work, and then run it again. It's a continual incremental building. You don't want to write the entire program out without running it once and hope you got everything right and then run it and find 20 different things that are wrong and have a whole bunch of stuff to track down. And that's why I did this the way I did. I want to, again, reiterate high-level things. We've built a function that'll give us a word at random. We built a function that will give us a gradually worse and worse picture of someone hanging from the hangman's noose. And we have built a function that will actually run the game for us. If we pass in a word, it will start to let us play hangman. And it begins by printing off an empty noose. And we've made all of this work by going to our main function, which again is the entrance point of the computer program when you're working with Python. And in our main function, we call this choose word function to actually get a random word. And then we call the play function, giving it that, that random word to have it do what it's supposed to do. Continues to run blank. I would check, uh, this is from Davis. I would check your very bottom thing and make sure there's two underscores on name, two underscores on main. I would check in my screen, lines 86 and 87, Davis. And again, don't worry, you'll get a full copy of the code when we're done. All right, so all we've done so far is we've managed to say, hey, let's play Hangman, and we printed an empty noose. Now let's start to put in a little more work. Let's go back to our play function go right after the print display hangman tries and let's start to build some logic here. Make sure that you are indented over. That's super important. Okay. And we're actually going to give a set of instructions that we will repeat over and over until either someone guesses the work. Sorry until someone guesses the word or they run out of tries. Until someone guesses the word or runs out of tries, we're gonna to continue to repeat guessing over and over again. Now, the way you do that to repeat something over and over again in Python, let me switch here, is this. All right. Actually, yeah, we'll put it in later. Um, you do a command called while, and then you're going to explain to the computer what are the conditions that you have that have to be true for you to continue executing what I will type next. In other words, on these later lines, all up in here, we're going to put a bunch of instructions. Right now, we're going to define what needs to be true for the computer to actually do those instructions? Well, one is that they can't have guessed the word. When we start, guessed, which means, hey, they actually accurately guessed the word, is false. So if they have not guessed the word, type it that way. And... They haven't run out of tries. So if tries is greater than zero, colon, uh, not tires, <laughs> tries. So what we put here are the conditions under which the computer will continue to try to, will continue to repeat the instructions we're about to write. We haven't written them yet, but we know what's coming. It's 
Let's ask the user to make a guess of a letter and let's determine whether or not they were right. And if they weren't, let's take appropriate action and unfortunately make things worse for them. All right. So here's the first thing. Let's hit enter. And very critical, you should be tabbed over twice now. Look where my cursor is right here. Tabbed once to be lined up with the W in while. Tabbed twice to line up with the I in while. If you're not there, fix it. All right, so what are we going to do until the person guesses the word or they run out of tries? Well, we're going to ask them for a letter. So we're going to create a variable that will hold whatever they tell us is their guess. What letter are they guessing? So let's make a variable called guess. And we'll make it, make it equal to, and now we're going to use a special command in Python to get their input. We're going to ask for them to type something in. So we use input. That's a command in Python. And we can prompt them. We can put something on the screen to tell them what to do. So put parentheses. And then in quotes, this is going to be our prompt. Please guess a letter. Now, I'm going to put a space after this colon inside the, 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 um, the quote marks because I want a little bit of space because they're, what they guess is going to appear immediately after this on the screen. Now, this part is important. Make sure you're at the very end after the parentheses. And we want to take whatever they enter, whether it's capitalized or not, and we want to make it lowercase. It just makes it easier to write this program. So we're going to say dot and then type lower and spread the C's. And what that does is Python knows that command. It takes whatever input the person gave you, even if it's capital, and turns it into lowercase. So I'm going to leave that on the screen. Let people get that right. So that's the first thing. Let's see if that works. I just want to see if we can actually do that. So let's, to test it, let's put in a print and let's print their guess on the screen. Let's just see if this works. So we run. It says, please guess a letter. And notice the cursor is blinking on the right. It's ready for my input. So I'm going to put the letter G. And look, it printed my G. So my input worked. Now, what if I do a capital G? Oh, it turned into lowercase. So the code is working right. If it's not, then check what you have here. Now, we're not going to print guess. I just put that there for you to test your code to make sure it's working right. I'm going to give you all just a second to catch up. All right, so erase that print guess because we aren't going to do that in the real game. What do we want to do? Well, first of all, we want to see whether or not they've actually guessed the letter. But how would you do that? Well, the first thing we actually need to do is see whether or not <clears throat> what they typed <clears throat> is actually a letter. What if they put the number six? Or what if they typed tuba? We want a single letter as input. So the very first thing we do is make sure they actually follow the rules. Because listen, if you were playing this in real life, someone can't give you a guess of 75. You're like, hey, we're playing hangman. Give me a letter. Give me a single letter. And they can't give you a guess of A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Like, no, give me one letter at a time. So that's the first thing we're going to check. And you do that, again, make sure that you are, are indented twice. Look where my cursor is. I'm indented twice, right below the G in guess. And so first, we're going to check whether or not they only, only gave us one letter. So do an if. And now we're going to check the length of what their guess was. So L-E-N is length. And in parentheses, 
let's give, we already know this length, length function. If we pass in something, it'll tell you how long it is. So let's pass in what their guess was. And let's do an equals, double equals checks, let's see whether or not <clears throat> something is, is, has equality, whether they're the same. And let's type one. This right here checks to see whether or not they only gave you one character as input. But again, they could have put a number in there. They could have put, you know, an exclamation point, whatever. We don't want numbers. We want letters. So now let's do an and, and we're going to add in another condition. We make sure that the guess itself dot is alpha. This is something built in to Python. It will automatically check to see whether or not what you're asking it to look at is just composed of letters or not. We don't even have to build that, which is nice. Thank you, Guido Van Rossum, for creating that. So everything on line 82 is designed to make sure that the input the user gave us is actually what we need. And this is another super important teaching moment. Computers must be told explicitly exactly what to do, and you must account for every possible user action. You have to account for it because if a user does something that you didn't build in a handling for, your computer program stops, it breaks, it won't work right. Because computers are stupid. They're just machines. They only do what they're told and they cannot decide to do something based on ambiguous data or no instructions. So you must be crystal clear. Now we have asked a user to only input a single letter, but we cannot trust them. If they put in more than one letter or they put in a number, we can't work with that. So what do we do? Well, let's put a colon at the end of this if, and let's define what they do. Now, what I'm gonna do is, watch this, let's define what to do if they don't give us the right information. This part is really critical. Make sure that you backspace once, so you're on the exact same level as the if. And we're going to put in an else statement. What if they have not given us correct input? We need to put a colon at the end of that and hit enter and you should be tabbed over one. What do we do if they didn't give us the right letter? Well, we're going to print not a valid guess. Let's test this. Let's see if this works. When you're caught up, Go ahead and run your code. 92, I made a mistake. Oh, I didn't put an if in here. All right, so my mistake, look at my line 82. I have to give it something to do on the if. So for now, let's just print correct input. We'll take that away in a minute. I'll let you get caught up. After we've gone through this little chunk here, I'm going to give you a, the rest of the code just in the interest of saving time because I think I've been able to teach almost everything I want to here. But let's test this here. If I hit run, I'm getting this. I'm getting please guess a letter. Now I'm going to guess a letter correctly. I'm going to say R. Good, correct input. Yes. Now I'm going to guess the number six. It says not a valid guess and asks me again. I'm going to leave that up there for a moment. That's the behavior you should be getting. And if you're not, you've got the correct code in front of you. All right. So I'm going to give that a minute because I'm going to switch gears here in a second.
All right. So let's talk a little bit about here about, again, some lessons here, some, some, some things to walk away with. And then we're just going to jump into a, what this looks like when it's working perfectly. Okay. So here's the big picture. When you're learning a new computer programming language, even your very first one, but this is true even for experienced professionals. If you'll keep in mind the fact that there really are only five elements to any computer program, it can help tremendously. And this is true, by the way. I have worked on computer programs that contain 120,000 files. 7.8 million lines of code. And I've worked on programs that are 30 lines of code and everything in between. And none of them deviate from this rule. A computer program absolutely will have an entrance point. It'll have a very first instruction. A computer program will absolutely make use of variables because it must account for data changing as the computer program runs. A computer program absolutely will have control and branching statements because we're building programs to make decisions that we would be making manually if we were doing the work ourselves. A computer program absolutely will make use of subprograms because each time you repeat a series of instructions and don't use the subprogram, one, you open yourself up to making mistakes. And two, if you change the way that series of instructions works, now you go, go, got to go back and change it in every single place that you used it. Whereas if you use a subprogram, you only change the subprogram and it is different now for everyone that uses the subprogram. And finally, and this is really important, every program has an exit point. When you're running a program, like say Microsoft Word, how many, how many of you experienced this? Let's say you got a computer and it's kind of underpowered, doesn't have the biggest hard drive, doesn't have a lot of like memory in it. And you're using Word and you're building a, you're writing a really big document. And all of a sudden your computer starts to slow down. You make editing changes and they're lagging behind. Well, the fact is that your computer behind the scenes is having to move data around inside of all the pieces, parts, and is consuming a lot of the available resources of that computer just for what you're doing. Now, let's say you were done editing that document, but you didn't turn off Microsoft Word. And instead, you want to play like Solitaire or something. Solitaire is also going to run slow for you because your computer is still reserving a bunch of resources for your huge Microsoft Word document. You have to close that computer program, Microsoft Word, in order for the operating system to know that it can release a bunch of those resources it was using before. So these five things are super important. And we've illustrated pretty much every one of them in here. We have an entrance point. It's the main function. And we've called the main function. This line in my, on my screen, it's line 96, is the very first instruction to be executed in this computer program. Everything else doesn't get executed until later on. We're making use of variables. We have a variable right here. We have a variable called tries, and it starts out with a value of six. We're using control and branching statements. We just built one. We ask for input from the user, and then we have two different sets of things that can happen based on what the person put in. This is control or branching statements. This code under the if is one branch. This code under the else is another branch. And finally, once the computer program ends, Python knows to release all those resources. The end part is one of the few things that you don't often have to be so explicit about, but it is there, I assure you. So we're at 1215 right now. I'm in central, so we're at 1215. 
and we've gone over a bit. Now, normally we would go on and we'd build right inside this if and uh, if this if here. When we have correct input, we put a bunch of logic to actually handle their guess, see whether it was correct, and then if not, build out yet another stage of them being on the hangman's noose. You can see the stages happen here. I don't see that taking that time, the trade-off is worth it. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to give you all the code. Thank you, Thank you, Frankie. All right. So let me grab the link for this. In fact, let me share my screen because I have it in the, uh, in the slide deck. All right, Re uh, Regina, if you can put that code into chat, I'd super appreciate it. You'll find a copy of the full code here, including what is inside that section of the first if. In other words, if the user actually put in the correct input, one single character, it'll show you what to do. And you've got all the pieces, parts there to fully understand this program. And in fact, if you just take what we went over with the five basic elements of any computer program, especially how subprograms work, you will be able to build out the rest of this program and understand it, which is actually pretty cool. And you can play Hangman. All right. So once you're done with that, if you want to challenge, customize the words used within the game. You might even find a way to have the user put in six or seven words and then start the game giving one of them a random. Although that would make it pretty easy. It's just, it's a fun challenge to be able to uh, build your coding skills. All right, so we've gone a bit over. I've got time for maybe one or two questions. If you, and, and then we'll, we'll do some wrap up and your free gift and everything. So let's look at the chat here. I'm going to enlarge it a little bit. There was a question earlier from um, Mike. He yeah. wanted you to go into a little bit more detail about the if name equals name main. Yeah. So at the end of the program where you totally type fine. that code. Um, so we could do a real deep dive on that. Okay. But here's the basic thing about it is every programming language needs a way to designate what the very first instruction is to be executed. With some of them, it's pretty simple. If you have a specific file that has some code in it, whatever instruction is at the top is the first one. When the creators of Python put it together, they wanted to have a, def a way that you could control what was actually the first thing to be executed. Normally, it's main but you can actually designate any function as being the first thing to run. And so what you're looking at in that if name equals main run main thing in there is just a bit of a complex, more advanced thing in Python as a way you could change what function you actually want to be the first one. In other words, trying to build a different configuration of it and have something besides the main function uh, be the first thing to run is a bit beyond the scope of this class, but it's actually a really brilliant question. I like that, that he asked it. So it's a way to control the actual first function to be executed. And I hope that helps Mike. I'll take one more here because uh, this is fundamental. Alan says, um, does the order of branches matter here if and else? Or can they be in switched order? They cannot be in switched order. That's brilliant. Right now, you can build whatever logic you want inside of each of them, but you have to start with an if, check your conditions on the if, 
and only then put in else. They built the languages, and this is true for all programming languages that have an if else construct. And pretty much all programming languages have if else. They built it to resemble English language and logic. And that's how we talk in English. If there are eggs at the supermarket, get six of them. If not, buy a pre-made omelet. That's the if else, if else. So it's always that pattern. That was a really good question. All right, good. Yeah, so we're going over. By the way, um, we're going to have a, a form here to be able to get a hold of us. If you have more questions, put them in that. Get a hold of us via the contact form. Um, and I'll do my best to respond because I actually love answering these things, okay? All right, so quick word about who we are and what we do because if you've enjoyed this at all, I really encourage you to find out more about the Tech Academy. This is the way we teach. Now, we had an hour here. And we did our best to be able to you know, move things along. I want to stress our boot camps are self-paced. They're not constrained by this little time thing that we had you know, in a workshop, which I hope you've enjoyed and gotten something out of. When you're going through our programs, you move at your own pace. So if there's things that are, you know, you can, you know really well, you can just breeze through them and things you need to work on a little bit longer, you have the time to do so. We have 12 boot camps, by the way, more than any other company in the world. All of them are authorized by the Higher Education Coordinating Commission. We've been around for a decade, and they're just, they're good boot camps. And it's not just us saying that. These are some of the awards we've received. Most of these awards we've received year after year after year after year for seven, eight, nine years in a row. And by the way, the boot camp industry has only been around for 11 years. So the fact that we've been around for 10 is pretty cool. These are our reviews online. We have thousands of reviews, averaging 4.8 stars overall. Um, this is especially, um, you know, we can't, these are totally like the real deal. When you go to look at these sites, you'll see like they vet every single review on here, okay? Um, if you want any information about us, just get a coding bootcamp guide. It's free. It gives you all your options. Um, just go to learncodinganywhere.com slash Eric. Regina, if you can throw that. Oh, it is in there, right? That's in, 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 the, in the, the, the chat, right? If, by the way, you happen to be a, a Tech Academy user already and you want to log back in and continue finding out more about the school, um, this is a reminder of what your login credentials are. We use your email address and then the passwords are the same for that portion of it. Um, and that's, that's what we have, right? I really do hope you've enjoyed this. Um, I love teaching it. We are going to continue to do these, okay? The other thing I really want to tell you about that we're really excited about, um, and you'll find out about it on um, our Meetup uh, account and our um, uh, uh, Eventbrite. In fact, you can just go to um, Tech Academy Events. Regina's putting a link in the, in the chat right now. This Wednesday, we're doing something really awesome. I'm giving a workshop, a free workshop, which is all about hardware. Now, we're a software school. We teach people to be technology professionals on the software end of things. But the fact is, to be a really good engineer, a really good technologist, you've got to understand the fundamentals of the actual physical machine. And it's something that's missing in a lot of training programs. And so on Wednesday, you'll see the details in that um, events link, right? Um, you can come get a free class from us, which I love delivering all about the internals of the computer and why you should care about them as a computer programmer, okay? Last thing is thank you for sticking around and participating. We're gonna give you a free gift and this one's really appropriate. We have a phenomenal book called um, Learn Coding Basics in Hours with Python. So it goes into a lot more detail. You'll also find in this book an expansive article about those five fundamental elements of any computer program so you can learn even more about that. So send in your email, with, uh, send in your name and an address, right? A physical address to books at learncodinganywhere.com. And um, our personnel will send out that book to you free of charge uh, within a couple of days. We're really, really prompt about those. Um, so that's it. That's what we have. Thank you so much for sticking around. I appreciate it. Um, I will stick around as well for a couple minutes if people want to do some Q&A. But other than that, have a fantastic new year. Hope 2024 is really good for you. And I hope to see you on future workshops. I'm going to watch this chat if anybody has any questions. Thank you, Alan.
And just a reminder, any interest you have, want to find out anything more about us, it's worth it. Go to learncodingware.com slash Eric, and that'll help. All right, AJ, why when I copied the code, the spacing was off? Every once in a while, when you're doing a copy-paste, you're talking about how um, the indenting, right? AJ, you're talking about indenting. Um, sometimes co uh, uh, word processors will insert odd formatting and it can be very frustrating it inserts tabs where you don't want them to um well you you may need to actually like tweak things a little bit with the indents on it to get it to run i did a full copy and paste of it last night just to make absolutely sure it was all running um and so i i would erase everything and do it again and then you'd have to look at the exact error you're getting but it, it's because word processors insert hidden characters they're different than text editors. The text editor, you see exactly what the content is on the screen. Word processors can add in hidden characters, formatting stuff that you can't see. That's why I, I, I don't use word processors for coding. It's just the easiest way to share that text. Thank you, Miriam. Any other questions? Uh, no error. Oh, the indenting was weird. I see what you said, AJ. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, as long as it worked, you're golden. And I can tell you, it may, have, it may have looked weird, but if it worked, that means that th there's, when you're running Python code on a computer, there's a specialized little utility called a parser that reads through your, your Python code to make sure it's formatted correctly. And if it isn't, it'll flat out fail, period, end of story. So even though it looked weird, it was formatted right. Yes, Davis, if you'll send an email containing your physical address and your name to, let me pull it up again, um, books at learncodinganywhere.com, we'll send you out a, a free copy of the book. And it's a really good book, no lie. Like Jack and I, my co-founder and I, put a tremendous amount of work into that Python book. It's really, really good. Excellent. All right. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Have a great day.